Uh, we're going to talk today about the technology part of the company and definitely jump in at any point if you have questions. So I'm going to start with just a little bit of my background. I was educated at MIT. I did both my undergrad degrees there and I got my master's degree in uh, focusing on cryptography, an aspect of math and computer science. I've worked, I began my career back in the 90s during what we call the dot-com era, during the first tech boom. Started off as a developer and became an architect and ran an engineering team. Then I moved on to become a CTO. I've worked at tiny startups as little as three people. I've been working out of living rooms at times. I've also been big corporations as big as 300,000 people, 300, people. Some of the largest corporations uh, in America and in the world. I've been an employee, I've been a consultant, I've been an independent consultant on my own. I've also worked in academic institutions. I think the only thing I haven't done is a true nonprofit that wasn't academic. The short, short summary, I've been all over the board. Small companies, big companies, all sorts of stages from we haven't made dime one to making billions of dollars a year. So I've seen a lot of different things. Right now, I am the CTO of Mass and Logic. We're a company here in New York, about six years old, 60 people. So we're past that early startup phase, and we're now into the how do we ramp up and accelerate growth phase. So the, the talk's divided into two parts. And the first part, I'm going to talk about what is a CTO, and then I'm going to talk about software development in general. So we're going to start with what is a CTO? There are a couple different terms. Bruce talked about you have the CEO, chief executive, CMO, chief marketing officer, CFO, chief financial officer. There's usually, it's a VP of sales, it's a more common title, sometimes we'll hear CRO, chief revenue officer. When it comes to technology, there's sometimes a couple different titles, and this can be a little confusing. I'm typically a CTO. You'll also hear CIO, and occasionally chief scientist. Titles will blur a bit, but basically these are how I really see the different types of roles. A chief technology officer tends to be someone who's focused a lot on software development or custom software, even if you're not developing software yourself. If you're a software company, you have a chief technology officer, and that's the person in charge of the product. If you are using a lot of custom software, again, you have a chief technology officer who's overseeing the software development. This differs slightly from a CIO, chief information officer, who's usually more commonly found at a non-technical company, but who has big systems. If, for example, you are a uh, large retailer, you're not really developing much custom software. You'll have a website because everyone sells on e-commerce, e but what you really have is some large accounting system, some logistics system, some inventory control system. These might be off-the-shelf systems that you've bought from other companies. And you have a lot of servers, you just have to make sure the servers are up, that your logistics are up so your truckers know when they're showing up to places, or your accounting can do monthly and quarterly reports. Your CIO will oversee this. It's not about building new software, it's about buying software and maintaining it and just keeping it working for the needs of the business. Then you have chief scientist. This is usually a researcher. If you're a scientifically oriented company, if you're a big pharma, for example, chief scientist there means you're head of R&D. At a lot of companies today, technology companies, we have a term chief scientist who is head of data analytics and research. And you'll see this, Google will have a chief scientist. Companies like LinkedIn, they say they have millions of members and people are connecting to each other. They'll have a chief scientist who's trying to figure out why are people connecting and how, and given the connections, what can we learn about people and how can we create new streams of revenue and new products. Some companies will just have one of these or possibly two. We only have a CTO, that's me, and so I kind of oversee the CIO aspects. I'm starting up a, a computer a data science group as well. Other companies will have both the CTO and CIO, and nowadays you'll see a chief scientist as well. But don't, this is, this is my general guideline. Again, you will see companies that blur these lines wildly. There are different types of CTOs in my mind at different companies, just like you have different CEOs. The CEO of a three-person startup is very different from the CEO of General Electric, which is a multi-billion dollar multinational company. I define CTOs in these four categories. First, I think of the startup coder type. 
when I get together with two other friends and say, let's do a startup. Okay, you'll be CEO, you'll be head of sales, I'll be CTO. What am I doing? At that point, I'm basically coding. That's really all it is. It's about software development. There's not a lot of management going on. There's a handful of people. Maybe I'll have one or two other developers with me, but okay, I'm the most senior developer. That's it. I don't really need to have, let's do monthly status updates. We're sitting next to each other. We talk to each other 17 times a day. Really, it's about coding. And so it's a very hands-on type of role in which you just take the lead. Then you get to why you define the next step up, the hands-on CTO. Here you've got a handful of people. So I, I, it's usually in the range of about four to 10 people. It's a very flat structure. You don't have a lot of hierarchy. You don't have you report to you and she'll report to him. Just look, we're all one team and they all kind of report to the CTO. In this case, you're probably still hands-on. A CTO at this level will still be writing code, but not 100% of the time. And you'll be focused on a couple of corporate level issues. Uh, you notice I talk about technology <laughs> strategy and all the architecture. In the first, I don't say, I don't mention anything about strategy, technology strategy, or corporate strategy. Well, at that point, there's just a handful of people. The strategy is, let's build the product. Let's actually get some sales and hopefully be profitable. There's not a lot of higher level thinking going on. It's just execution. It's just do. Whereas at this stage, you start to think, well, we could take the product a couple of different directions. The world is evolving. Our industry is evolving. And you have to think and stay ahead of it. What new technologies might we want to bring in? And where do we want to be in a couple of years? But you're still very hands-on and in the code. At the next stage, this is where you start to move away from, from being in the code. At my current company, for example, I actually look at the code maybe once every week or two. And right now, it's just because I've been I'll pop over his son's computer and kind of look over their shoulder and say, what are you working on? Hopefully I can do a little more of that. But as you grow, when you're running a team of 40 people, you're not touching the code anymore. You don't have time. At this level, you probably have multiple reports and you've got some hierarchical system. You can't have 40 people coming directly to you. You'll probably have about five or six and they'll have individual groups or departments and they'll report into me. So you're a lot less hands-on at this stage. You're still focused on overall technical strategy. You're, you're still focused on architecture, but it's at a different level. You're not getting into the code level architecture. You're thinking about the big picture architecture and how's the system going to work and how are we going to integrate with our customers, our partner systems. You're also spending a lot more time at the corporate level. I mentioned corporate strategy. This is where you start to think about how are we doing with fundraising and what are the key partnerships and how do I work with the chief marketing officer to hit certain initiatives that they want for the coming year or two? So I, I deal a lot more with my peers and with other groups within the company as opposed to just heads down in my group. There's also what I call team organization because at this point, when you're a flat team, when you have five people, again, there's not much organization. We're five people. Okay, great. Let's all get together. We all fit in one room. When you're 20 people, 60 people, Suddenly you have to think about, should we be three separate groups or five separate groups? Should I have one layer or two layers or three? Who reports to who? How do I get these teams to interact? And so you start to think about how the team is organized, and that becomes a, an important piece of what you're doing, especially at a startup where things are constantly changing. And then finally you have the corporate level, and this is where your department is going to be probably over 100 people. At this point, I don't even know the names of everyone under me. I might know the names from a list, but I certainly don't have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with each person the way I could, even at 40 or 60 people. And so now they're, they're kind of names on the list. I couldn't tell you what anyone is working on. I just know them as, oh, here's a report, and this is what this team is doing. And so it's, it's much more of that larger picture. You're doing technical strategy, but as part of corporate strategy. And so you're not even necessarily quite as much in the details of the technology and you're relying more on the people under you to make certain technical decisions, even, even some of the key decisions. Uh, one of my colleagues talks about, at a big corporation, all the real work is done at the middle management layer. Because if you're an executive, you're not really making decisions. You don't have time to go research these things and decide. It's the middle managers who are making decisions and bringing you information. And nominally, you, you wave your hand and pick A or B, but they've really led you down the path. And if there's a C choice that they didn't like, they didn't even bring you the C choice and you don't know about it. So at, at this level, you're, you're very disconnected from the day-to-day -day work. 
personally, I like working at the middle two layers. I find them a lot more fun and I feel a lot more engaged. And you'll, you'll find, by the way, this is probably true of if you're in marketing, if you're in sales, if you're in another department, you'll probably find similar levels just within that department, a similar level of how hands-on or how much you're focused on organization and management. One key thing to note for those of you who are thinking of doing startups, I meet all these startups who say, oh, we need a CTO. Yeah, we're a bunch of business people, product people, but we need a CTO. Oh, you're a CTO, why come work for us? These companies don't really need a CTO. They need someone to be writing code most of the time. And so when they try to engage someone like myself, I still code. I think I'm a decent coder. I'm not as good as I used to be. I'm not coding 40, 50 hours a week the way I was when I was a developer. And so I'm not as good. And if they bring me onto their project, well, I can code and I can do it, but you're in some sense overpaying. Because for what I cost, why don't I just hire a cheaper developer and just have this person develop the code? There are a lot of things I can do that a beginning developer can't or a mid-level developer can't. I know a lot about corporate strategy and management and hiring. And you don't need to do that when you're two or three people, when your company is tiny. There you just need to be writing the code. And so when they look for someone like me, they're really misfocused. There's a caveat to this, which is if they just have that pure coder, then they run into the problem of the coder says, OK, I'm writing code, writing code. This is cool. Use this technology. And they don't necessarily have the larger picture vision. They don't necessarily think about what are the implications of these decisions 18 months, 24 months down the road. A good model in this case is you get that junior or mid-level developer, you hire this person, they work on your code, and then you find someone like myself, you find someone at the CTO level who is on your advisory board or consults to you part-time and can give you that direction because you only need that 10% of the time, 20% of the time, a couple hours a month. And this way, the, the coder, you're getting much more cost effectiveness for your dollars. You're investing it in the coder who's producing code and not in the guy who can do great strategy that you don't need much of. OK, in a technology team, there's a lot of different things that can fall under you. And this is an outline. Only if you're at the corporate level might you have all of this. The first group, and this is the most common, and this is what we think of, is a software development group. If you're a chief technology officer, you've got software developers. You're building software, especially if you're a software company. And I tend to work primarily for software companies, so I have a lot of software developers. You might also have a QA team. These are the quality assurance people. The developers are writing the software. The QA people are seeing, is the software doing what we expect it to do? Does it meet the specifications? They'll find bugs. Also very common, you have IT, and I, I kind of group this together. Most of the time I work with sysadmin, system administrators. These are the people who monitor the servers. What happens for website crashes at 2 in the morning? They're the ones who make sure we get alerts, hopefully make sure it doesn't crash in the first place, or if we do have a problem, the system is self-healing in some way, it can handle it. You will also find at some companies they'll have what they call tech ops. This is big companies where you're dealing, the line blurs a lot between system administration and tech ops. And it's more a matter of software versus hardware. System administration, they tend to deal with the operating systems and installation and the packages you need. Tech ops, this is when you have a really big facility. When you have hundreds or thousands of computers, you might even own uh, actual real estate where you're putting your servers. These are the people who deal a little more with hardware. Let's put in new routers. Let's worry about the air conditioning system, because it appears to generate a lot of heat. Let's figure out how we can reduce the power consumption of the system or get better, better bandwidth connectivity inside or to an outside vendor. The two at smaller companies are typically one and the same. We have one person, and he basically does it all. Uh, in fact, he does a third piece as well, which is help desk. And help desk is when you have a large group of people Things happen. Computers, we all run into problems. You can't print. You have a virus. We need to upgrade everyone to Windows 8 for Windows 7. It's your help desk that will usually deal with this. And there are, if you're a big corporation, if, for example, you're General Electric, within your divisions, you probably have help desk teams. You'll have dozens of people who are there to support everyone. At small companies, it usually falls to the developers to do that too. 
those are what I consider the core services uh, within, within technology. Those are the ones you'll find most commonly. At bigger companies, you'll also find some of these other groups. Professional services. So for example, if you're a software company, you build this great software and you sell it or you have it as a SaaS service, uh, software as a service when you get something online through the internet. But sometimes you have a big client who says, I love it, this is great, but I need you to connect it to my system. I'm willing to spend a lot of money with you, but I don't want to have to deal with it. There's some integration issues. I don't have the team or the bandwidth or just the desire to do it. Make it happen for me. And then you start to build up a team of people who are engineers who focus not on building the core product, but how you actually integrate this product with your customers and with their systems. Sometimes this is a separate division. Sometimes it falls under technology. That's a professional services group. There's project management. Project managers actually deal with a lot of the day-to-day, -day, okay, what's the project, when's the deadline, are we on time, are we falling behind, why are we falling behind, how do we make sure we don't, what could go wrong, where are the risks, did the vendor deliver on time? They're dealing with a lot of the details. When I'm with a team of 10 people, that's me. When I'm with a team of 50 people, I will probably have one or two project managers to help out because, again, I can't be at that level of detail. In some companies, that will actually be a separate group, and then you get what's known as a matrix organization. So you have developers who will report up into someone like me. Okay, I'm a technology guy, and my, I've got my director of engineering or VP or CTO telling me this is what we're working on. But then, so I've got this level of reporting, and then I've got this cross-reporting of these project managers saying, for this, are you on time? We need to know, and we've got to send some information to ask reports this way. I'm not a fan of matrix organizations, but sometimes it's, it is the, the right solution. Just adds complexity because now you have two layers of reporting. Technical writers. This is when you're dealing with large systems. You might need to document it. Internal documentation, external documentation. These are people who have to have a technical background to understand what you're doing and speak with the engineers, but also have to be good communicators and translate it into something your customers can actually read and understand and use. Then you have product management. These are the people who are saying, what is a product? What are the new features we need in the next quarter? How do we want to position ourselves uh, 24 months from now? That is sometimes a separate department. Sometimes it comes out of marketing. Sometimes it falls under technology. And then finally, data science. And this is where you might have a chief scientist. And this is doing data analytics. That as well, sometimes it's independent, sometimes under marketing, sometimes it's under technology. So there are a lot of different groups you might find. Most commonly, it focuses just on the first three, on software development, particularly if you're a software company. Anytime you have software development, you need QA. And then, of course, IT, because you have to maintain your systems. And everybody, even a tiny company, there's always some, some aspect of help desk. It just might not be a dedicated function. All this in mind, this is what I, as a CTO, typically focus on. And ideal, as I mentioned, in those middle two layers. If I'm a hands-on startup CTO where it's me and two other guys, I'm coding most of the time. If I'm a big corporation, I'm probably just looking at paperwork most of the time. But when I'm in that middle layer, when I'm somewhere around 10 to 100 people, this is where I spend a lot of my time. It's really broken down to these four groups. Strategy. So this is where I'm doing at the corporate level and really, the job of CTO and the job of the technology department is to say, what is the corporation trying to do? What is our product or service or why are people paying us money? And how do we make this happen with our software? What do we need to build to make people pay us more money, or at least want to? I also have people coming to me and saying, this is what my department needs. These are our goals. How can we update the software? to meet these goals. So I'm trying to satisfy the needs of the other groups as they try to help us make money through technology. So that's at a strategic level. What can I do for the core product or for the different departments to move us forward with our goals? Realistically, a lot of my day is spent in that translating category. I need to understand technology. I need to understand when a software developer has a bug. OK, you're stuck. Let's get into it. Let's understand what's this technology doing? How do we solve the bug? How do you decide between different technologies? I need to be very technical. And this is why a CTO really should come from either a system administration or software development background, or possibly a QA background in some cases. But you have to be able to get in there. 
On the other hand, I also have to speak to the business guys. And this is a problem a lot of software engineers have, is they only know how to speak in technology. And they're speaking Greek. And everyone's just looking at them and completely lost, saying, I don't understand all these technical terms. Can you solve the problem or not? It's usually not black and white. The engineer's trying to say, well, we can solve it this way, but these are the risks. This is a cost. Here's another alternative. And if they're not communicating well, it's hard for the business person to understand the risks and costs and opportunities. I spend a lot of my day doing this translation. The business folks say, this is what we need, and it's usually in some high level, not really well-defined way, and I work with engineers, this is what they mean, and these are the implications, and this is what we have to build, and this is what we have to watch out for. And then the engineers come back to me and say, well, here are the implications, and here are the risks, and here's the problem with that, and I can solve the problem this way or that way, but these are the trade-offs. And they say it very technically. I then go back to business and say, these are your options and we figure out. So I spend a lot of my day just being a translator between the two sides. And that's really probably the most important skill I think a CTO needs to have. Then a good deal is spent what I call leading and blocking. And this is just day to day. The engineers, this is a white collar job. This is not working at McDonald's where you have to supervise and say, are you flipping your burgers fast enough? Am I watching to make sure you're not stealing from the register? It's a white collar job. These are smart, motivated people who want to be there. I don't have to be there, crack the whip, and say, please work. I need to be there and say, what do you need to get your work done? I need to first give them the direction. This is what we're building. We're building this this month. That's going to be next month. It's just saying the tone and saying the direction of what we do. Obviously, this comes from the other departments, going back to the strategy and to the product. But it's about, concretely, this is where we need to focus. And then it's a lot of blocking because the developers get interrupted all the time. You get these help desk issues of, hey, my computer doesn't work. Oh, you're an engineer, fix it. Well, that's not really his job and he has to do something else right now. Or you get problems with our account management group, for example. We always have problems because there are bugs in our software currently and we're working on addressing those. And every, every system's gonna have something. When you have the bug, the account manager says, oh, I'm having trouble with this, or I need to get some data, this is a special request, and they'll walk over to a developer and say, make this happen for me. Well, maybe that's more important than what the developer's working on, maybe not. And the account manager can't figure it out. From her perspective, yes, this is important, but maybe from the corporate perspective, it's not. So I spend a lot of time trying to figure out prioritization and making sure the engineers are focused on what are the high priority tasks and saying, okay, what else you need? We'll put it on the list, but we'll prioritize it appropriately. And then finally, you have HR. And this is true, really, for any manager. If you're an expanding company, you've got to be hiring. And if you're a good manager, you're worried about the people under you and developing their skills and careers and them as a person. Particularly in technology, and particularly these days, there is just such excess demand. We can't hire developers fast enough. I spend a lot of my time going out trying to hire people and making it especially challenging. There are HR departments who will help with hiring, though frankly I've found most corporate HR departments are not great at doing that. But even when you have a small HR team who's competent, because we deal with a lot of technologies that is Greek to some people, most HR people don't understand the difference between different technologies, they can't get as into it or as detailed, it's not as easy for them to recognize the right candidates. There's a lot of subtleties in terms of, well, they use this technology, but they used it a certain way, and we need it done a different way. And that's where it's hard for an HR person, so I have to spend a lot of time doing this. I spend a lot of my time doing hiring and trying to mentor my employees. This is a word of caution. I see these failure modes among CTOs very often. These are the three most common of all the problems. As I mentioned earlier, I did a lot of consulting. I'd go into companies and try to fix their problems. Sometimes I'd help them grow. A lot of people called me to fix their problems. And it usually came from one of these three issues. First is what I call odd man out. When you have your executive team, and you have your CFO, and CEO, and VP of sales, and head of marketing, and your CTOs in there, they look and say, well, we're external facing, the head of sales and the head of marketing and the CEO, we're all very external facing. We're out there, we're talking to the customers, we know what's going on. You're the CTO, you really don't need to leave the office. We'll tell you what the customers want, we'll tell you what's happening in the industry, we'll tell you where things need to go. And they come and they say, 
great, uh, we just figured out this is what we need to do. Can you build this for us? Sounds good. Call us in six months. And they don't really integrate with the CTO and say, what are our options? Where can we go? What technologies have you seen that might give us new opportunities? And so you have a group of executives, instead of working together like this, they work together like this. And the CTO is left over here. And you get poor communications. And so what technology is building and what they're capable of building diverges from what the company thinks they're doing. Second, you have what I call the kid CTO. And this goes back to when you have a startup, very often you see, especially among younger folks, oh yeah, I'm starting a company. Oh, and uh, yeah, there's this guy, he used to live in my dorm in college, so I called him up, he's a tech guy, he said he could build it, so yeah, he's building the system for me. Okay, yeah, he's the tech guy. It's kind of like saying, well, I remember back in college, there's this guy, he was pre-med, so I got to go in for heart surgery, and I called him up, said, can you do it, you're a doctor? He said, sure. He's a podiatrist, but you know, medicine's medicine. And you get the same thing with technology, that people are saying, I say, it's tech stuff. This guy's a tech guy, he can do it. And you don't necessarily get the right <coughs> technology guy. Uh, you see then the, the, third, the third problem as well. Um, but in the second case, this person might even be okay. He's a tech guy, he's a developer, great. You bring him in and he works, but the skill set that it takes to run two other developers where you're coding 80% of the time is very different than the skill set when you're managing a team of 80 people. There, as we said, you're not writing code, you're actually managing people. Very different set of skills. You need to understand technology in both. So what happens is, this guy, oh, he's great, he's writing the code, we're doing well, and now all of a sudden we went from three people to 30 people, and he or she doesn't know how to manage that team. And that's where I get a lot of calls where I say, we've got this great technology guy, but he's not good at managing the team, so why don't you come in as a VP of engineering under him, he's a CTO, he's a founder, we gotta leave him the CTO, you run the company, or you run the department, but he's a CTO, so I report to him, but he really reports to me, because day to day I have to tell him what to do, and when there's a management meeting, well, he's the CTO, so he should go, but I should go, do we both go, does one of us go, it gets really confusing, it is a mess. That's the one I see most often, and it is a disaster every time. What I tell people, hire the lead engineer, if he needs a title, Director of Engineering, VP of Engineering, but keep that top slot open because if you have to hire over, you don't want to have this, well, I report to him and he reports to me. And then the third case, you get, well, I call it the uh, playing on the six characters of the search of an author, six execs in search of a CTO. Bunch of product guys, business guys, and they say, we need a technologist, you come in, and he picks a technology. So I'm a Java guy, we're going to do this in Java. I'm a Ruby guy, let's make this happen in Ruby. Okay, well, is that the right technology? To, to a certain order, they all work, but some are better than others. And if you pick the wrong one, you're not gonna see it in six months, but three years down the road, if you're in the wrong technology, it's not gonna work. The analogy is saying, well, I need to, uh, I need to get to Chicago. I need a vehicle. Yes, oh, great, well, we've got all these compact cars. Compact car will get you to Chicago, and it's not a bad choice. And if you're worried about fuel efficiency, that's the right choice. If you're worried about moving your house, that compact car is probably not your best option, right? There you need the semi-tractor uh, trailer. Likewise, if you cared about fuel efficiency or speed, the tractor trailer is not going to be great for you. And so you want to figure out what your technology is before you bring in the CTO who says, this is what I do. A good CTO you bring in should say, well, I've got a couple different technologies and I can bring you a range of options. Or if they can't, because realistically, most of us, we spend a little more time in some versus the other. Get some outside people you can trust, people on your advisory board, who can direct you to the right technology, and then you find the CTO. Right? Don't put the cart before the horse. Um, I mean, just going back a couple um, minutes ago, mm -hmm. you said that um, you know, there, I mean, it happens a lot in a startup where, you know, you come, you're going along and then all of a sudden you need a CTO, but the CTO spot is already taken and you're coming in, but you don't have the title, but you're doing the CTO. How do you manage those expectations? I mean, I'm a tech person and if it's not logical, I don't, it's very uncomfortable for me. So I don't know how to maneuver around that kind of, you know, I mean, politics. Like, what would be your personal step? 
it's really tough. And I found the best way to do it is to say, best of luck, I'm not working here. <laughs> That's really it. And, and you have to get them to recognize this is not the right way to do it. The, when, if you are in that situation, if there's a company where they do have the CTO, you have to say to the CEO and or CTO, this person needs to step down. They are always a founder. They should always keep the founder title. You can give them special other titles. Chief architect, for example, that's a very <coughs> important one. You recognize that they are still a technical leader, that they have contributed to the company, that they're a core part of the founding team, but they're not the person in charge. And that's really the only way to do it. Otherwise, you do get that very mess. And it only gets worse over time. Just go in and declare to okay, your boss. What's or, that? So, so just go in and take charge, pretty much, and well, declare. Well, you, you have to get the, the two to buy in, right? The CEO has to buy in, because you report to the CEO. Exactly, but like that buying CEO. in process, you know, getting to that point, how do you do it? For that, that goes to how do you convince anyone to, mm -hmm. to adopt a certain position or move a certain way? For me, it's laying out to them, let's talk about what you're doing now, what's working, what's not working, what your ideal solution looks like. And at a certain point, if I can get them to draw out, well, the CTA will spend most of his time writing code and he'll report to you for all the decision making, but he still has the title and we'll bring him into these meetings and he says, well, why does he need to be in those meetings? What's the, the purpose? What's the benefit? Eventually, I start to realize what you described now is not the CTO role for him. It's the lead engineer, chief architect, something else. And when you look at the description of the roles they're bringing you in for, that is the right role. Okay. So just lay out the costs and benefits and put on your business management hat on everything. Exactly. I, if you can get them to define the roles without titles, and then you step back and look and say, now what title would you give it? Mm -hmm. It should be pretty obvious that they're not the title that you're initially assigning. So that ends the first part, which is well, what a CTO is. Or if you're not thinking of being a CTO, this will probably be a little more interesting because this is how you're going to be working with the CTO and what's some of the problems you're going to have. <coughs> technology is really hard. <laughs> Building technology is hard. And everyone thinks it's because technology is complicated. It's not. The major problems in technology are not so much technological as sociological. It's really important. It's not that we can't figure out how do you connect the servers or what's the algorithm or how do you make this all work. We do face those problems. And companies like Google faces those problems in a big way. Google has to figure out how to get a lot of data to be defined and organized in a very fast way. And they need people with PhDs to do it. And that is very hard. Most of us don't need PhDs. The company I work at now, the last few companies I've worked at, a high school kid could understand this. It's not way over his head. It's not that she needs to have an advanced degree in computer science or math to get. It's we have people over here, and they want to talk to people over here, and how do we make that happen? That's all there is to it. What makes it hard is that how we communicate to each other screws it up. One of the examples in a class I teach, we use the German Bundestag. That's the German parliament building. And if you remember, when they unified, they built this new parliament. And it was this beautiful building. And in the main <coughs> meeting room, it was built out of glass. And they built it out of glass because this is very symbolic. It's transparent, so people can see in. You can let the sunlight in. From an architectural perspective, very interesting and meaningful. They put a sound system in there. And when they went to use it for the first time, they go in, a person goes up to the podium, speaks into the microphone, no sound comes out. Fiddle around, nothing's happening. So they test the hardware. Microphone's working, speakers are working, but the whole system's not working. So they eventually go back to the old parliament building until they can figure this out. And they do an investigation. They look around and they look into the software. It must be a software problem if the hardware's working. Turns out one of the specifications was that there needs to be no feedback in the room. If you think about the physics, when you have a room of four glass walls, sound will reflect off the glass and will be picked up by a good mic. 
the only way the algorithm could figure out how you get zero feedback is to turn the amplification down to zero, which is what it did, hence you got no sound. So what went wrong? The software engineers did what they were told. They were told, don't do feedback, and here's the algorithm, and I am giving you no feedback. The architect did what he was told. You wanted a room with four glass walls, and I put in four glass walls, and it was nice and beautiful. So they <coughs> did what they were told, but the whole system failed. And this is because it's not that we couldn't figure out an algorithm, we couldn't figure out how to wire up the mics, we couldn't figure out how to install glass walls, but when you put it all together, we didn't think through the whole system, we didn't communicate. By the way, Mr. Architect, uh, will there be any reflection off these walls? Or by the way, Mr. Software Engineer, did you know sound will reflect you might want to take that into account. And somehow we miss this. And this is why software projects fail. It's not because we couldn't figure out the algorithm. It's not because it was too complicated for us. It's because we didn't speak and talk about what are all the implications and issues. So when you focus on software development, focus not so much on the core technology. <clears throat> you have to focus on the people and communication issues. And the way I think about doing this is I look at what's the information flow. Specifically, who needs to talk to whom, when they need to do it, and what they need to talk about. When we have that group of three developers, when we're the early stage startup, that's pretty easy. We're sitting next to each other. If one of us has a question, we just turn and talk to each other. But when you're 50 people, you can't do that. You can't stick everyone in the room and hope they all talk to each other at the right time and the right way. And this is where we start organizing and saying, do I need two teams or do I need 10 teams? And of these teams, which teams need to talk to whom? Do they talk to each other every day, once a week, once a month? When they talk to each other, what do they do? Does this team tell this team what they're working on? Do we just put them in a room and hope they figure it out? Do we have specific ways they need to communicate and say, this is what we're building, and here's our project plan and date? What do they need to know? And this is where I spend a lot of time trying to figure out what needs to be communicated. The key thing to think about is that software is simply a process. That's all it is. A computer program just says, do this and then do that and do something else. In certain cases, maybe do this or do this 10,000 times. That's all it does. There's no real thinking, it's just automation. It's a really dumb monkey doing what you tell it to do. And what often happens is the business doesn't think about what their process is, what the workflow is, and they say, hey engineers, go build me this. And then what the engineers build isn't quite correct because you didn't explain to them what needs to go on and what happens in the process at each stage. If the business can't define the system, there's no way the software engineers are ever going to get it. So I think about what is the process flow and then how do we communicate this to the engineers and then how do the different systems that the engineers are working on, how do those communicate to each other? And it's all about information. Information flow in the system, and information flow as part of the project that the engineers are working on. Going back to specifications for a moment, the example I gave more, this is one of the things that make it really hard, trying to define what the project is. Missing something like there are glass walls, and therefore sound will reflect. Specifications are really hard, and we often find they're inconsistent or incomplete. They're inaccurate or simply ambiguous and trying to get it perfect, trying to get a complete, consistent, accurate, clear set of spec specifications, it's a holy grail. We should all try for it, but we should recognize that's not going to happen. And so one way to counter this is to regularly check in on what's going on. A common failure mo mode in old ways of doing software and as a waterfall method is we start a project and we don't look at it until six months later when we put it all together. And then it comes together, and we say, oh, it didn't quite work out the way we thought it would. Or the business people say, that's not what I told you to build. Yes, this is, this is what I heard. You said this. Yes, but that's not really what I meant. And you don't just wasted six months building this thing that business doesn't want. If you check in monthly, if you check in weekly, if you're going down the wrong path, you can adjust course corrections. For this reason, one of the big trends in software engineering is a process called Agile. You'll hear a lot of people talk about an agile development process as one in which you do cycles of one to four weeks, at the end of which you check back with business and say, okay, you told us what to do for a few weeks, this is what we focused on, is this right, do you like what we're doing, 
If so, let's tell us what to do next. If not, if there's a misunderstanding, let's pause and we can fix that right now before we go further down this path. When dealing with projects, everyone needs to understand what's known as the engineering triangle. You have scope, cost, and time. These are the three variables. As business folks, what we like to say is, I want you to build this thing, I want to have lots of features, and you only get two developers, and you have to build it by next week. Make it happen. That can't happen. If you're trying to build a house, and you want it built really quickly, say, I need you to build this really big mansion. I need you to do it in a month. Well, if you got a thousand laborers, and you worked around the clock, you might be able to do that. Or alternatively, if you limit the number of laborers, but say I need it in a month, say, all right, well, I can build you a two-room house. It's not going to be a mansion. This is all you get. Right? You can trade off one against the other two. And so the failure mode that we often see is someone on the business side says, I want to constrain all three things. I want a lot of scope in a little time with these fixed number of resources. Instead, you have to say, which of these are important and which do I, do I let slide? And a good CTO or a good engineer will recognize what you're trying to do and say, I can do this quickly, but it's going to cost you money, or we're going to limit scope, or this is how we can trade it off, and here are your options. So always think about the engineering triangle. And this applies not just to software engineering, but really any type of project you do. Fast, cheap, good. Here, good, quality is we're substituting for scope. And sometimes you'll see people trade off against scope and quality, and you'll have four dimensions. But any project always recognize you can only constrain so much, but you can't constrain everything. Question? Do you know uh, uh, what's the average time for uh, creating a, a smartphone app? The average? Um, let me put it to you this way. What's the average time between driving between two, di what's the average time to drive between two cities? Yeah, but. <laughs> But you know, more or less, uh, you can be uh, creating your app for four years, for example. You know, you need uh, to be specific and to, to, you know, it's a, a very dynamic market. And, you know, what's the typical average that uh, a project of this takes? No, it, it, it's the city driving. We know you can drive between two cities in less than a few months, but whether it's a couple hours or a few days, or even potentially a few weeks if you're driving from Europe to Asia. I can't really say. It depends on which cities you pick. There are people who can build a quick and dirty app in a matter of hours or days. There are people who will spend months building an application. Could be years, uh, though as you point out, if you're spending years, you're probably missing your market window. But it really depends on the complexity of the app that goes to that's your scope, and then how many engineers you have building it, that's your cost, and then from there you can figure out your time. If you want to make the time smaller, you can either reduce your scope or you can add more engineers. It's not quite linear adding people. There's the old expression, nine women can't make a baby in one month. Right? You can't parallelize that work. Right? Or if we use the, the building analogy, I, I said somewhat loosely, you can just throw a thousand people at it. Realistically, you can't have a thousand construction workers on, on a house. They just physically can't all fit around the house. So you can, certainly if you go from one plumber to two, you're probably about twice as fast. Going from two plumbers to 40, I don't think you're 20 times as fast. But in, in terms of your question, it's just how you want to trade it off. But, but it is a plumbing job. Because I was out in Asia, and um, one of the biggest mobile, one of the top five mobile um, application develop, development company, I mean, they're headquartered in Barcelona and New York here, but they, they're, all their engineers are in Cambodia. So I would go into, you know, like if, if I was, like, I'm back in school, but like if I were to have to do it all over again, I wouldn't just concentrate on mobile technology, but more of like a, you know, what you're doing, business and technology. They're all viable spaces, yeah. mm -hmm. right? If you're just doing mobile applications, that's probably for the consumer, though there are business mobile applications. I actually built some of those 13 years ago. 
back before we had a lot of high-end mobile devices, is just whatever space you're interested in and you know. Mm -hmm. And really remember that it's not about the technology. You can solve these technology problems. You can find someone to solve it for you. Do you understand the business problem? And so sticking to a space you know well, so you recognize as that as space evolves, you can evolve with it. Because a good technologist who doesn't understand the space can build this really cool, interesting product that nobody wants. Right? Or a good business person can say, I've got a great idea, but if they don't know how to get it done or they get the kid CTO who can't scale with the company, they run into problems. So it's important to, if you're a technology person, understand the business you're in. If you're a business person, certainly understand how to work with technology if, it's, if that's a core part of your business. Yes? For a starting company, what is the most interesting, I mean, in terms of costs uh, for a company it's to um, for the CTO to buy to buy the softwares or to create them? That is the famous question known as buy versus build. At which point is it cheaper just to buy something off the shelf that's there that you get tomorrow? It's probably cheaper than what you can build yourself because they built it for all these other people versus doing your own custom development, building it yourself. When you're building software, it takes a lot longer. I can't just get it tomorrow. It will probably cost me a little more, but I have control. It's very customizable. I can add exactly the features I want, or I can alter them to work a certain way that I want, and I can take in a direction that I want to go, whereas if I'm buying some off-the-shelf product, if they're not adding the features I want, I'm out of luck. Yeah, maybe it's better if the um, CTO is part of the company. I mean, if he's, um, he's one of the, cre the creators, so he's doing it for free, actually, for the company. Not for free, but all he needs is uh, <laughs> the material to create the software. Well, as a CTO, you're probably building software for your, yeah. your company, you and your team. Yes. And you mean if it's not the core company product? No, I mean, um, if in your team, when you just start a company, you have a financial uh, guy and a technolo technology guy, maybe um, he can create a software and it's going to be cheaper than buying one for his company. Well, if it's... The if question it's is, um, w what really matters uh, in, um, in uh, evaluating the cost of creating a software? So you mean, for example, if for the finance guy says I need an accounting system, should the CTO build an accounting system or should he buy one? Yeah. Right. So it's not your core product. Obviously your core product you should build yourself because if someone else is building it, why would anyone buy from you? They'll just buy from who's selling to you. In that case, it comes down to cost, time, and flexibility. Uh, the accounting system, there's a, a great example. We're not an accounting company. I don't want to deal with accounting software. It's cheaper just to buy. So if you orders of magnitude cheaper, I can buy accounting <laughs> software for a couple hundred dollars a month if it's a service, or a few hundred or a few thousand dollars just off the shelf. If I tried building this, I'd spend three years trying to figure this out. Because if you think about a company like Quicken, that's a very common uh, accounting software here in the US, Quicken software, they have had probably hundreds of developers working for years building this system. I would need to invest hundreds of developers working for years to match that. No point in having me do it. If, however, there is something custom, if I am building some new type of logistic system that's going to be part of my edge, uh, maybe I want to write that myself. The company famous for that is Walmart. Walmart's real advantage uh, when they were growing up and expanding, you all know Walmart, the very large mm -hmm. retail store? What gave them an edge wasn't the fact that they just had stores in better locations than their competitors. It was they had a, an amazing logistics operations team. They did what's known as cross-shipping. Instead of, I get it from vendors, I stick it in the warehouse, then some other truck comes from the warehouse, I stick it on, on the trucks and it goes to my retail stores. They said, get all the trucks here at the same time and just move from one truck to another. And this way I save a lot of time from I have to put in the warehouse, I have to keep track of it, and I have to get out of the warehouse is much more efficient. I don't believe there was any, I don't know this for certain, but I don't believe there was any software that helped them plan this. They had to write their own software. 
And even though they're not a software company, they're a retail company, and that's, that's what their business is about, here they said logistics is part of their core competency, and an off-the-shelf system wouldn't work. It was worth investing to get a competitive advantage. So you have to figure out when you're looking at a piece of technology, if it is part of your competitive advantage, you probably want to build that because you'll be investing in something no one else can unless they've invested the same amount of time. You'll be an expert at, and as you evolve your company, your product, as the field evolves, you have control to evolve that. If it's not part of your core competency, why are you investing your resources in it? You're not going to be as good as competing against someone for whom that is your core competency. So a very common example, uh, this isn't software per se, but when you do a startup here in the US, no one does paychecks anymore. Meaning like physically writing out, oh, it's the end of the week, end of the month, here's your check, here's your check. We all did that back in the 60s. And then we figured out no company is gonna beat someone else because they have a better payroll system. Payroll's just one of those necessary things we all do. No one ever says, oh, I wanna work for this company because of their payroll system. So these third party companies came around. The common ones are called Paychex, ADP, forget who the, the other third player is in the space, and we just hand it out to them. And so the paychecks at my company are all printed by one of these companies. They're all managed. When they send your tax information at the end of the year, they take care of it. When they keep track of, of who's an employee and our employee accounting systems, it's all done by their software. It's all done on their servers because that's not what we want to spend our time doing. And every one of our competitors will do the same thing, but that's fine. They're no better or worse than we are. We're going to compete in what our core business is. So when it comes to your ultimate question, buy versus build, if it's part of your core competency, you probably want to build. Otherwise, you're going to buy. And uh, my last slide here, this is just something to keep in mind as you're building software. This is a cost of fixing a bug. And so on the x-axis, we see time. On the y-axis is the cost. We see it goes up greatly. Think about it this way. If you're building a house, and at some point you decide you don't like the location of the inner wall and you want to move it, how much does that cost to do? If you start out, you're at the blueprint stage. The cost is near zero. It's the cost of an eraser. Erase that line, and you put the line over there. Really easy. Once they've laid the foundation, maybe you have to change the foundation a little because this is a load-bearing wall. Once you've actually put the walls up, the house isn't constructed, you just have the framework up, well, to move that wall, and then you've got to take it down, then you've got to shift the wall, there might be some weight and load issues. Once the house is actually built and you're living in it, at this point, taking down the wall, you've got to deal with electrical systems, you've got to deal with plumbing systems, you've got to deal with the fact that people are living in the house. It's a lot more costly than when you're at the blueprint stage and just erased it and drew it somewhere else. Same thing is true for software. The earlier we catch a bug, the easier it is to change it. So you want to look early, and this goes back to getting regular feedback from the business owners or ideally your customers so you figure out if you're on the right path. Change is always easier earlier. So with that, I'm glad you guys started asking more questions. Uh, let's see if you have any others. Yes. So where did you prefer to work in a startup or in a big company? For me, definitely the startup. That's a matter of personality, I think. And it's you have to figure out what's right for you. What I enjoyed about the startup is you have a lot of influence. Even when I was a developer, most junior person on the team, I could still walk into the CEO's office and say, I've got a question. Why are we doing this? I had an idea. Can we talk? It was a 40-person company. Very easy to walk into his office. He was fine with that. At a large corporation of 300,000 people, you might not even be in the same state as the CEO. And even if you are, you can't really just walk into her office. So I felt I have a lot more influence at a smaller company. You get to know the people better. You see more of the business. For me, it was important to be exposed, that I wanted to understand not just technology, but marketing and finance and sales and the other aspects of the business. Again, at a large corporation, those groups might even be in a different state. At a small size company, the person running that department is a couple feet away. 
Now, if you want to learn about it, it's easy. If you want to say, you know, I'd, I'd like to learn a little more about marketing. Can I go to some marketing events with you? Can I sit on some of your meetings? That's pretty easy. You can't do that as easily at a big corporation because they are everyone slotted and it's a lot more control over how people are organized interact with each other. So that was the right fit for me. I think as well, bureaucracy was a big issue. I hate the red tape and the paperwork and all the policies and procedures. I would always run afoul of corporate regulations at big companies. Um, not in, in major ways, but usually it got in the way of my ability to do my work. Whereas a small company, not much regulation, just kind of make it happen. 